I'm going to start here where we ended part one, which was with this observation by Watson and Crick. It's not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we've postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. So this little sentence here had a huge implication in, in history and in your career if you stay in biology, especially if you go into molecular biology, because so much of our biotechnology is based on just that observation, which actually turned out to be slightly wrong. There were nuances, many, many nuances that they couldn't appreciate just based on the structure that they saw. What they did see, however, was this. Like I said last time, if you look at the two strands of DNA, they're connected together, held together by these weak hydrogen bonds. And so here is an animation that I want to show you of that process of, that they were thinking. This animation, by the way, interestingly enough, comes from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, which is one of the laboratories, one of the most famous laboratories in all of biology, uh, because uh, much of what I'm about to show you uh, in this lecture actually was discovered here uh, at that uh, laboratory. So in this animation, we have DNA in a cage, some sort of prison. I don't know why, but at any rate, you can see the double helix here, the major groove, the minor groove that we saw before. It's not a particularly good representation, but you can see here are the bases that are pairing here. There's a base pair there and a base pair there. And if you remember all of your details, the width is 2 nanometers, 10 exactly of these base pairs makes one twist of the DNA and so forth. Uh, and what Watson and Crick saw, just from the structure of DNA, was this process. Since those two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds, they can be easily separated, just like this as shown in the animation. Now, look what's happening after they separate. New nucleotides are being put in base by base, right over here, that's a nucleotide, that's a nucleotide, that's a nucleotide, and so forth, being put in base by base on this strand and on this strand to make a new double helix. But notice, these two new double helices are going to be identical to the first one. And this is the idea. The idea, you, you see these bonds here. Those bonds are the hydrogen bonds that are breaking. And as these nucleotides are matched up with new nucleotides, then they have to be matched up to complementary nucleotides, which means this and this, these two brand new DNA molecules, have to be identical base by base to the previous one. All right, so why were Watson and Crick wrong? Well, they weren't really wrong. There was a lot of what they thought was right. Their basic idea was correct. The nuances were really much, much more difficult to see just from the structure. One of the nuances was the way in which DNA and RNA are always built. And the second has to do with how it is that the enzymes evolved to actually control this process of, re of replication. First of all, if you remember, here's the Watson and Crick model. If you remember, they had uh, postulated that it was anti-parallel, meaning that if this strand here, notice this strand here, the three prime carbon is down, so that's the three prime end. And if we follow the strand up here like this, follow the cursor to the end, that's the five prime end. But on the opposite strand, it runs the opposite direction. So if this from bottom to top is three prime to five prime. This from bottom to top is five prime to three prime. Okay, and that's the anti-parallelism idea. So that created a problem because it turns out that when DNA and RNA both are replicated, they're always replicated in the same direction. They're always replicated five prime to three prime. They're always made in that direction. And that created a problem. So to see the solution to the problem, what I'm gonna do is walk us through the events as we currently understand them of DNA replication. I'm gonna do it in a very schematic, very highly simplified way uh, using these kind of cartoons um, that make what's happening very clear, but they're not at all realistic in terms of, of the geometry. Uh, so this is what I mean. Look at this. Right here, this is supposed to represent DNA. And you can see in the upper strand, this line here is the sugar phosphate backbone. This line on the bottom is the sugar phosphate backbone for the other strand. And each one of these rungs on what looks like a ladder on its side is a DNA base pair. So normally this would be represented as a double helix. In fact, that's what it would be in its actual geometry. So when I say cartoonish, this is what I mean. It's just sort of representing it in a very, very conceptual, stylized way. So this is double-stranded DNA, and this is where we start. Now, when DNA replicates, it doesn't replicate from the end of the chromosome down. It actually starts in the middle of the chromosome in a place that's called the uh, origin site, the replication origin site. What happens is an enzyme comes and binds to the DNA at that, uh, that uh, origin site, like it did here, for example, and that enzyme is called helicase, represented here by the sort of pink donut. And what the enzyme does is it separates this double-stranded DNA into two separate strands. 
exactly as Watson and Crick predicted based on just the geometry of the molecule that they were postulating. So they were right so far. Uh, this is exactly how it begins, and again, the enzyme that, that starts this is helicase. Now, this is wildly oversimplified. There are a number of other enzymes involved in this process. Some of the enzymes come in here and remove the histone proteins that, if you remember, make up the nucleosomes that I showed you in Unit 1. And there's another enzyme. That enzyme is called topoisomerase, T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-I-A-S-E. I'd like you to look that up in your book and take a look at what that does. Your book talks about it. This schematic doesn't have it. But I want you to look that up and get the information that you can about exactly what it is that that enzyme is doing because they work together with a helicase to allow the DNA to unwind and form this structure, which is called the replication fork, obviously because it looks a bit like a fork. So it takes a double-stranded DNA and splits it into two single strands of DNA. Because of antiparallelism, of course, if this strand on the top is running three prime on the left, or sorry, on the right to five prime on the left, the bottom one has to run five prime to three prime in the same direction. So, so far, so good. Everything is exactly what Watson and Crick predicted. But remember, when new nucleic acid is built, doesn't matter whether it's DNA or RNA, it's always built in the same direction from five prime to three prime. We'll see why that is shortly. So that's the first problem that has to be dealt with because this strand up at the top is going to be built in one direction, the strand at the bottom is going to be built in the other direction. But there's another problem, and this is another one that you can't intuit, you can't understand simply by looking at the structure of the molecule, and that is that in, the, in history, no enzyme has ever evolved to bind to either single-strand or double-strand DNA and start making new DNA using that as a template. Why that's true, we don't know. It's, it's, it's unclear exactly why. However, there is a solution, and that solution is to start, instead of making DNA, start making RNA. Now, before we get to that point, we have to stabilize this replication fork. The stabilization is done by a series of proteins that are called single-strand DNA binding proteins, represented here by these sort of pink circles. Now, this is insanely oversimplified, but at any rate, these single-strand binding proteins, which are abbreviated SSBPs, will bind to this uh, strand, especially on this strand, in fact, on the bottom, less so on the top, and support this replication fork so that all of these other enzymes can function. So like I said, though, there's no enzyme that's going to bind to this single strand here and start putting in new DNA, but there is one that will put in a short stretch of RNA, and that's exactly how it starts. The whole process begins when an enzyme called primase binds to the single strand of DNA and puts in a stretch of RNA. And so what we have here is a double helix of DNA and RNA, and it's therefore hybrid nucleic acid. And as you can see here, it, just like DNA, is built from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So notice the new strand here, this green strand, is the new prime, primer, pardon me, it's RNA, and it's built by this enzyme called primase. In fact, that's why we call the enzyme primase, because this stretch of beginning RNA is called the primer. So the primer then, in this particular picture, is a little misleading. It's shown as only three nucleotides. In reality, it's between 10 to 15 or so. It varies. And the primer is what gets the whole process started in the actual replication. Now, the primer is put here on this strand. Notice going from left to right. Top strand, same thing. Going from right to left, because of antiparallelism, there is another primase enzyme that comes along in here and puts a primer in. Once the primer is there, then you can have a polymerase that's going to bind to the primer that then will put in new DNA. And that polymerase is called DNA polymerase because it's going to actually be making new DNA. And this particular one is called DNA polymerase 3. I'll give you the reason why it's called 3 here shortly. But what this DNA polymerase 3 does is it binds to the 3' prime end of the primer. You can see that here, this sort of kidney bean-shaped object is meant to represent the DNA polymerase 3. It binds to the 3' prime end of the primer, and then, operating as it always does, going from 5' prime to 3', prime, it starts making new DNA. Okay, and you can see that here. See, it goes to the left. Okay, I'll do that again so you can see it. There, it goes to the left. Now, notice that this strand is going to the left. Now, this strand is going to do exactly the same thing, but it's going to go to the right, because the, the DNA polymerase is going to bind to the 3' prime end here. When it binds to the 3' prime end, then, of course, it's building 5' prime to 3' prime. It goes in the opposite direction. Now, the way this is shown, it looks like it comes to the end of the chromosome, but that's not the way this works. Remember, at the beginning, I said 
that this whole process actually starts in the middle of the chromosome in a replication origin site. So this is not really what happens. It doesn't just end there. I'll show you what happens at the end of the chromosome in just a moment. But at any rate, notice this is going one direction, this is going the other direction. Now here's where it gets kind of interesting. It has to do with how it is that this is going to move here. So this object here, the replication fork, the helicase, is going to move to the left moving in the same direction as this DNA polymerase 3, but not this one. This one's going the opposite direction. And that sets up the problem that I was talking about before that we have to solve. Now, one thing before we get into the solution to that, I want to talk a little bit about how this DNA polymerase works. It is going to read this strand here on the top. Later, I'll call that the template strand. It reads this strand here and matches the proper nucleotides in. So, for example, if this right here is a T, it's going to grab an A and put it in there. If that's a C, then it's going to grab a G and put it there. So that's what it's doing, and I'll show you the details of that shortly. But it's also doing something else. It's also proofreading its own work. So this process isn't perfect. For example, occasionally, if this is an A, instead of putting in a T, you could put in a G. When it does that, it hopefully will not let that uh, uh, stay, because if it does, then you've got a mutation in this new strand. That mutation uh, can cause all kinds of problems if it's in the middle of a, of a part of the gene or anywhere else in the genome can cause uh, various issues. So in this uh, complex right here is a proofreader. So what it's doing is it's looking about three or four nucleotides behind where the front of this enzyme is working. And as it's looking, it looks to double check to make sure that the bases are lined up correctly. For example, that's an A, that should be a T, this is a C, that should be a G. Suppose this is a G, that should be a C, but instead it mistakenly put in a T. Okay, so that's, a, that's an error. Usually, not always, but usually this enzyme will recognize that, see that there's the error, stop the whole process, and pull the whole thing back in the opposite direction. And when it does that, it starts ripping out the nucleotides that are just put in. And it'll do that. It'll pull it back dozens to hundreds of nucleotides, rip out the mistake that it made, and then do it again. And it'll do that every time it makes a mistake, usually. Every now and again, it misses, and then the mistake is permanent. You get a permanent mutation. So that proofreading is absolutely critical because it takes the mistake rate down from up to potentially 1 in 100,000 nucleotides and makes it more like one in 100 million to a, to a billion nucleotides. So it's a much, much uh, a more important structure than just simply putting in nucleotides. It also can, can correct its mistakes. All right, now let's get into this other issue. If this is going to move in this direction, the upper strand is going to move in the same direction that the helicase moves, the opposite strand is moving in the opposite direction. Let's focus on the upper strand here. This one's the easy one. What happens is this moves to the left, and so does the polymerase. So watch as, I, as we do the illustration here. You see the whole, the whole stuff moved to the, to the left. Let me do it again. There it is. Everything moved to the left. This strand at the top is moving in that direction. So the strand that's moving in the direction of the helicase is what we call the leading strand because it just follows it and it goes all the way to the end of the chromosome following this helicase and it continually makes the DNA. It's very simple. It's very straightforward and that's pretty much it for the leading strand. But this strand down here, this bottom strand, has a problem, and that is that this guy has already moved to a point where it eventually is running into something that's going to stop. So how do we replicate all of this material up here? That's the problem that the cell has to solve now. It solves it in the same way that it solved the problem in the first place. What it's got to do is to bind again a primase, make a primer, and then put in new DNA here. So that's exactly what it does. Primase comes in, puts a new primer in here, then DNA polymerase 3 binds to that 3' prime end of the primer and moves along. But now here's the problem. It continues on until it runs into the previous one. You see that? So this goes to here and it gets into this fragment right here. And that whole object then runs into this and has to stop. So the DNA polymerase has to stop at that point. So it goes primer, DNA, primer, DNA. And it does this discontinuously and continues. So let's watch what happens. If this D, uh, helicase moves to the left, Again, the leading strand follows it, but you see the lagging strand has to put in a new fragment. It has to put in a new primer and then make a new structure that goes all the way to the right. So it keeps doing this, and this lower strand keeps making these structures like this. Now, these structures are called Okazaki fragments. They're called that named after the Japanese scientist 
who discovered this process and discovered this discontinuous synthesis of the lagging strand. Again, that's what we call the lagging strand uh, because it is uh, going in the opposite direction of the helicase. So you see the upper strand, this leading strand, the lagging strand are very, very different in their, uh, the way in which they produce things. So we've got a problem because when we're done, we don't want to have any of these RNA primers in our DNA. The DNA has to be completely nothing but DNA. So that's the first problem. Second problem is this. Look at the Ozaki fragments. There's no connection between them. So we need to put bonds in there to connect one Okazaki fragment to the next. So those are two other problems we have to solve. The first problem, removing the primers, is done by another DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase 1. What DNA polymerase 1 does is it comes in here and rips out the primers. It binds to the 5' prime end of the primers, rips them out, and replaces every single nucleotide that's RNA with a DNA nucleotide, just like DNA polymerase 1, but it removes only the primers. It doesn't remove the other DNA. And same thing down here in the lagging strand. It removes every single primer. So when, when it's done, this top strand, the leading strand, is beautiful. It's nothing but all DNA. It's, it's perfectly gorgeous. Everything's great. Bottom strand looks good, except for one last problem, and that is that these nicks, these spaces between the Okazaki fragments are still there. Okay, now you might be wondering, why is this called DNA polymerase 1 when DNA polymerase 3 acts before it? You also might be wondering, what's DNA polymerase 2? I'm not going to talk about DNA polymerase 2 in this class. That's something you'll learn when you get to your upper division uh, courses. Uh, but there is definitely DNA polymerase 2, and it, it, it functions in other things. The 1, 2, 3 is not the order in which they act. It's the order in which they were discovered. The very first one was DNA polymerase. They found a second one, so they called it DNA polymerase 2, and the first one was DNA polymerase 1, and so on. Okay, so now we've got everything looking good, except for on the lagging strand. We still have these spaces here. These spaces, these little what we call nicks in the DNA backbone, in the sugar phosphate backbone, attract another enzyme. And this enzyme right here is called DNA ligase because it ligates, which means to connect these Okazaki fragments together. So what it's going to do is it's going to form a bond right there and a bond right there in this particular picture. And those bonds are what? Well, remember, this is the sugar phosphate backbone. So you should recognize that these bonds that it's going to form are going to be phosphodiester bonds, that phosphate bridge that connects the 5' to 3' prime carbons on the DNA. So once ligase has done its job, then the lagging strand is all perfect and gorgeous now too. It has no primers in it and all of this brand new strand is complete. So now both leading and lagging strand are complete and we've got everything all set and ready to go. The only problem now is what happens when this gets to the end. So I'm going to talk about that here in a moment but before we do that I want to get back into the DNA polymerase 3 and look specifically at what exactly it's doing before we continue on with looking at how this whole process ends at the end.